Hola, buen día. Bienvenidos a los seminarios de Fronteras en Sistemática, Biodiversidad y Evolución del Instituto de Biología. Una disculpa por el retraso. Aquí estamos ya listos para dar inicio, inicio a este que es el quinto seminario de la serie, el quinto y el penúltimo, el cual va a terminar esta serie de seminarios en el mes ya de mayo. Eh, para los que no estén muy familiarizados, les recordamos que esta serie de seminarios se inauguró durante este semestre y continuará así durante cada año, el primer semestre de cada año. Y la idea es eh, invitar a grandes eh, líderes en sus áreas de, de estudio, en diversas áreas en, que tienen que ver con biodiversidad, evolución sistemática. Y dada la pandemia de COVID, bueno, durante este año fue todo de manera en línea, pero la idea es que a partir del siguiente año se pueda hacer presencial para que los ponentes no solamente nos platiquen, sino también puedan convivir con el personal académico y sobre todo con los estudiantes durante un día o si es posible durante más días. Eh, en breve les vamos a hacer llegar un recordatorio para toda la comunidad para que nos envíen sus propuestas y empezar a planear la que será eh, la serie del 2022. El día de hoy eh, tengo el agrado de presentar al doctor Rob Voltel y eh, no quiero hablar mucho de él. Just thank you very much again, Dr. Rob, for being here. Um, y voy a presentar también al doctor Atilano Contreras, quien es el anfitrión justamente de este seminario y quien nos hará el gran favor de dar la presentación del doctor Roth y de conducir la sesión de preguntas. Quiero finalmente agradecer también a, al doctor Pedro Mercado y a Verónica Ramírez por facilitarnos un lugar para, para transmitir el seminario nuevamente. Muchas gracias y los dejo eh, a ustedes dos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Lázaro, Rolf, a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thanks very much also to the Institute for giving us this opportunity to host Dr. Boitel in this series of seminars, Fronteras en Sistemática, Biodiversidad y Evolución del Instituto de Biología de la UNAM. Gracias a la directora, Dr. Susana Magallón, del Comité Organizador. Well, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Boitel with us. Um, he's a very well-known entomologist, mostly because of um, all the contribution he has made through his career um, in insect morphology, but also in insect phylogeny and, and several different orders of insects, primarily aquatic beetles, but also other orders. And Dr. Boitel obtained a bachelor's degree, a diploma in 1982, and a doctoral degree, PhD, in 1986 from University of Tübingen. And more or less since 1994, he has been a professor of entomology and zoology at the Institute of Systematic Zoology and Evolutionary Biology in Jena, Germany. He has many contributions in entomology. He has about 267 um, refereed papers from original research, about 19 uh, revision papers and books, and about 31 book chapters. So he has a tremendous contribution. And he has been a very important leader, uh, at least from my perspective, on insect morphology. And as we know, there's been a revolution uh, from in systematics through these decades, but also with the, with the um, um, arisal of molecular data, and lately with phylogenomics and all these new sources of information. But Dr. Boitel is um, some sort of an inspiration because, at least from my perspective, um, uh, we can tell that morphology is still alive and it still has a lot to contribute with different approaches. Um, technological approaches, for instance, um, micro tomography, micro computer tomography, and other uh, new techniques. And um, there is still a lot to do with insect morphology. At least that's what I would like to believe. But he's going to tell us in a moment. I would like just to, before giving him um, time for his presentation, just to mention that he has um, made some very important contributions. Recently, he published in 2014. Uh, 14, Insect Morphology and Phylogeny, a textbook of entomology that I have here with me. 
about nearly 80 years after a classic by Snodgrass. So that, that was a very, very welcome contribution, his book. Also, he was part of the authors that contributed a paper in 2014 in science um, that uh, may call phylogenomics resolves the timing and pattern of insect evolution, which is a very important reference on insect phylogeny for several years since his publication. He also published a new insect order, fossil order, Alienoptera, which is a very interesting insect group between roaches and mantids. Also in 2019, he participated in publishing a very important paper, The Evolution and Genomic Basis of Beetle Diversity in PNAS, which is a very important synthetic paper summarizing all uh, that is known about beetle phylogeny and evolution. Uh, so without more uh, preamble, I welcome Dr. Boitel and please, Ralph, this is all yours. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much, Atilano, for your very friendly, flattering words. Thank you, Lazaro. I'm sorry about the technical delay, but I think that should not be a great problem. In any case, it is a very great pleasure for me to give this presentation. Uh, Lamentablemente no puedo estar en México lindo, pero así es la situación, así es la vida. Mi castellano es muy malo, por eso voy a dar la presentación en inglés. Lo siento. Please, the next. Entomology has been a somewhat isolated branch of zoology. At least this is the case in my country. This is probably due to the fact that insect collect collecting has been very popular among non-scientists over centuries. But I want to emphasize that this is by no means a negative point. Amateur collectors have made a tremendously important contribution, of course, by providing countless specimens, but also for creating data which are now very important, especially in the context of climatic change and the dramatic decline of insect diversity. Aside from this, entomology is today a very strong, a very modern discipline of science. I hope I will be able to demonstrate you this in my presentation. Next slide, please. There are many reasons why insects are extremely fascinating. One major point is the extreme diversity distinctly more than one million species are described. This is uh, more than half of all known organisms. This is, of course, uh, an enormously fascinating phenomenon from the evolutionary perspective. What were the reasons for this uh, unparalleled diversification? The problems, the challenges of phylogenetic reconstruction are more or less the same as in other groups of organisms, but due to the extreme diversity, the complexity of the group, uh, collecting appropriate data can be very time consuming, can be a real challenge in any case. Working in insect systematics also involves a lot of routine work. Next slide, please. In my presentation today, I will talk very briefly about early developments in insect systematics in the late 19th and early 20th century, when the German dipterist Willy Hennig will play a major role, and then I will mainly talk about uh, ongoing analyses of very 
extensive molecular data sets. Next, please. My group was founded uh, almost 20 years ago in the Philetisches Museum, which is part of the Institute of Zoology of the Friedrich Schiller University of Jena. Uh, next, please. And this beautiful museum was founded by the famous but also notorious uh, German zoologist Ernst Heckel, who coined the term phylogeny among many others. This is the next. Our main field uh, of research, Attilano has already mentioned this, is morphology and anatomy. And we made strong efforts to optimize anatomical investigations. And I think we were quite successful, uh, especially microcomputer tomography combined with 3D reconstruction turned out as an exceptionally useful tool and with a combination of different well-established and also innovative techniques, we could greatly accelerate the acquisition of high quality anatomical data. And within a relatively short time frame of maybe five years, we were able to compile very large and well-documented morphological data sets for three major groups of insects, the Polyneoptera, the Perineoptera, and also the extremely diverse Holometabola. Next, please. So morphology is clearly my passion, but uh, it would be extremely short-sighted if we would ignore the tremendous progress in molecular systematics in the last decades, especially in the last 20 years. And so we are happy that we are a member of the OneKite project. OneKite is short for 1K Insect Transcriptome Evolution. Bernhard Miesow is the leader of the group, which was founded uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, I think since that time, this primarily molecular project has been very successful. And what makes it really special is that not only molecular systematists play an essential role, but also morphology, developmental biology, and also paleontology. A major study was published in 2014. Thank you. This was Misov et al. published in Science. Many other studies followed. I will talk about some of them. Uh, some focus on major subgroups of insects and others on a specific evolutionary question, questions. And uh, presently, it is safe to say this 2014 phylogeny of insects is the state of the art in insect phylogenetics. Next, please. But now let us go back to the 19th century and the famous founder of the Philetisches Museum, Ernst Teckel. Even though insects uh, were definitely not his favorite groups, he uh, published the phylogeny covering all insect orders in one of his major contributions, his major works covering all animal phyla. And uh, even by the standard of his time, he chose a somewhat unorthodox approach or a very unusual approach. He classified insects based on one character system, the mode of food uptake, and of course, closely related with this, the configuration of the mouth parts. So what you see on the left side now, he combined the hemimetabolous emitterans with the holometabolous true flies, the dipterans, both with sucking mouth parts. 
And on the other side of the cladogram, he combined the hemimetabolous orthopterans, grasshoppers and relatives with the holometabolous coleoptera based on biting mouth parts. And from today's perspective, maybe not only from today's perspective, this cladogram, this classification is absolutely obsolete. Next, please. A uh, very remarkable insect phylogeny was published only 12 years later by Carl Dommer, uh, 1908. He was a specialist of Phylloxera, the Weblos in German. And uh, without going into the details, but his cladogram comes very, very close to what we uh, obtain today based on very extensive molecular data sets and refined methods. But still, by this time, maybe the next, a consistent and well-defined phylogenetic method methodology was not available. Nevertheless, with a very profound knowledge of insects and their morphology, Donald developed this remarkable phylogenetic scheme. An interesting point is that he uh, still combined the archaeognathans, the apterigode bristletails, with the equally apterigode zygentoma, the silverfish, in one group, the thysanura. But he absolutely correctly placed the zygentoma as the sister of pterygoid insects in this phylogenetic diagram. So this uh, was definitely a remarkable achievement. Next, please. In the mid 20th century, the dipterist Willy Hennig really revolutionized systematics by introducing what he called phylogenetische systematic, phylogenetic systematics. And this has a tremendous impact. This can be compared with the impact of Darwin's and Wallace's work about one uh, century earlier, the evolutionary theory, so everything changed with Willy Hennig and what is now known as cladistics also evolved from Hennigian phylogenetic systematics. In 1969, he published his groundbreaking uh, Stammesgeschichte der Insekten, in English, Insect Phylogeny. And this book was very remarkable definitely a breakthrough. The next, please. This is a summary tree uh, combining different cladograms from this book from Willy Hennig. This is from Chael, uh, 2016. And a lot of what he postulated by that time, of course, based on morphological data, based on an informal character evaluation was confirmed later by molecular studies, including results from one kite. What was essential is that he had a very sound theoretical concept, especially with a refined definition of monophyly and the concept of synapomorphy. This played a crucial role. Next, please. So phylogenetic systematics evolved into cladistics and uh, an essential feature of cladistics is numerical computer-based uh, character evaluations. And the two first study using this approach were published in 2001. One of them was Boyd and Gold, 2001. 
a study mainly focused on the evolution of attachment structures. And the data were mostly extracted from Hennig's work and also from repeated very thorough review studies by Niels Christensen. The next, please. So Niels Christensen was a very important mentor for me and a very good friend. May he rest in grace, please. He was a wonderful man and the information he provided was just invaluable. So it was not very surprising that uh, the phylogeny we published were really close to what Niels Christensen had in mind and also, of course, Hennig. So that was the application of a new approach. Many insights about the evolution of attachment structures, but not really a breakthrough in terms of phylogenetic innovation. The next, please. The second study based on uh, cladistic evaluations also of morphological features was Wheeler et al. 2001, cited numeral times, mainly based on 18S and 28S RNA, frequently used genes and on an analytical method called POI, developed by Walt Wheeler, and this means simultaneous alignment and parsimony analysis. The morphological data uh, were extracted from the literature, a uh, pretty large morphological data set, but I must say to a certain degree this was uh, quite superficial and maybe not the main point in this study from the beginning. Next, please. So the molecular results were presented first in this study published in Cladistics. And, and I must say the results look very chaotic. Either gene or also both of them combined, not even the monophyly of the orders was confirmed and what is a rather bizarre, bizarre result. This is marked by the red arrow. You see that strepsitrans were placed outside of the insects in the widest sense, which is of course not only unlikely, but impossible. So in the second step, the authors combined the molecular and the morphological results and the Phylogeny looked a lot better with uh, major groups held together by uh, morphological characters. Please, the next. So this was chaos. The next, please. And this is what the authors called a summary tree. Please, the next. And as they wrote this summary tree was based on the data and the discussion. This is somewhat unorthodox. And I will not really go into the details, uh, but uh, I will show you one major result. The next, please. The authors combined uh, the parasitic strepsitrans, a very small order with the megadiverse diptera, the true flies, they call this presumptive clade halteria based on the presence of halteres, uh, but on the mesothorax in the case of strepsipherins and on the metathorax in the case of dipterins. And this was in very clear contrast to Hennig's idea, who at least tentatively combined the strepsipherins with the coleoptera, the beetles, or even Roy Krausen, a uh, famous coleopterist of the 20th century, who placed the strepsipterans inside of polyphagan beetles. So what followed? Different analyses based on single genes, for instance, JL 
2006, but I will make a leap forward now and continue with a study published by Misov et al. in 2014. And this was not based on two or several or maybe two handfuls of genes, but on 1478 orthologs, an enormous data set and uh, sizable taxon sampling with about 150 terminals, of course, covering all orders of apterigode and pterigode insects. So the analytical methods were distinctly improved with this study. And it is needless to say that uh, bioinformaticians did a very, very good and very important job especially I should mention Alexis Damatakis and uh, not surprisingly enormous computer clusters were needed uh, for the analysis for the analytical procedures in this case at the University of Heidelberg and the University of Munich. An interesting outcome of this one kite study was that most of what Willy Hennig previously suggested based on morphological data and non-numerical character evaluations was confirmed. So, and uh, when this study came out, Niels Christensen was asked to comment on this for science literally already on his deathbed and he flatly refined, uh, defied to do this. He refused and a few days before he passed away, he called me on the phone and he told me this was sobering, disappointing. <laughs> I was also involved in this study. Rolf, I'm not impressed with this publication at all. So I was disappointed, but I don't really agree with him at this point. Several things are very important with this project. The enormous amount of data, the refined analysis, uh, tremendously efficient workflow was developed and last not but not least, what was very important, a combined effort of molecular systematists, bioinformaticians, but also morphologists, anatomists, also developmental biologists, and last but not least, paleontologists. So this was a lot of innovation in terms of methods and a very, very good, close and friendly and efficient operation. Next, please. What Willy Hennig did not anticipate was that hexapoda, the insects in the widest sense, are not the sister group of the myriapods. This was assumed about for about 100 years, the so-called tracheata. Even analyses of several hundred base pairs showed that hexapoda are more closely related with the crustaceans. And this continued with analyses of several single genes, Giribet et al. 2005, for instance. And this was also strongly, clearly confirmed by transcriptomes, for instance, von Reumann it al. 2012. Uh, the study also came from Bernhard Misov's lab. And here the solid result was that hexapoda are nested within a clay plant crustacea. They are, so to speak, secondarily terrestrial crustaceans. So this was a Breakthrough, in my opinion, already shown by early molecular studies. But what remains 
A problem is the precise placement of the hexapods in these plant crustaceans. The question, what are the closest relatives? Please, the next. And the hot candidate is Remipedia. This is a very obscure, small, highly specialized group of blind cave dwelling free swimming crustaceans. And Van Cook and co workers uh, studied the brain structures very intensively in 2004, a quite fascinating study. And they found out that specific features of the brain of these Remipedians and hexapods look very similar. And based on this, they postulated that Remipedians might be very close relatives of hexapoda. So this was later confirmed by the molecular data and now this appears quite likely. So interesting, a very small specialized group and the group with the highest diversity of all lineages of organisms. Morphological comparisons are very difficult. Apparently, uh, very far-reaching morphological transformations took place with the change to terrestrial environments. And with this, homology is often a problem. And the phylogenetic signal, which may have been present on the phenotypic level, obviously largely or completely eroded. The next, please. The pen crustacea, of course, concept, of course, implies that hexapods and myriapods have invaded the terrestrial environments independently. Unfortunately, it remains completely in the dark. Uh, what happened in the earliest evolution of hexapods still in the aquatic environment. The fossil record tells us nothing about this, apparently. Please, the next one. So this interesting uh, looking fossil was named Devono hexapodus by the authors uh, Fabian Haas and co-workers. He was my first PhD student, by the way. And Haas and his two co-authors interpreted this as a basal stem group hexapod living in marine environment. Very fascinating, and this would have had far-reaching uh, evolutionary implications and would have closed a major gap in the arthropod fossil record. However, this was re-examined critically Carefully, next please, by two paleontologists from Bonn, Gabi Kühl and Jess Rus, 2009. And first of all, they found out Devono hexapodus was only a single deformed specimen of a species already known, Winters helicus bacchesi, and they argued convincingly this is not even closely related to hexapods. It likely belongs to the stem group of the arthropods in the narrower sense. In any case, this species tells us nothing about the early evolution of hexapods in the marine environment, unfortunately. This underlines the simple message that fossils should always be evaluated very critically, very carefully, before they are used for far-reaching evolutionary interpretations. This can lead to very misleading interpretations and conclusions. The next, please. What nobody really questioned in the era of morphology-based uh, systematics was the monophyletic origin of hexapoda insects in the widest sense. One apomorphic feature was considered as the main argument 
a specific tachmosis with a head with six segments, a relatively compact thorax with three segments, and an 11 segmented abdomen. So this was considered as rock solid. Next, please. And for a short time, this was challenged. Italian colleagues, Nardi and co-workers published an insect phylogeny based on mitochondrial genomes. And they postulated or at least discussed uh, placement of Columbula the springtails outside of hexapoda, which would mean, of course, insects in the widest sense are not monophyletic. But if you look at trees in the appendix of this study, you can see that the honeybee and the louse are also placed outside of hexapoda among some crustaceans. And this is, of course, not unlikely. This is impossible. So uh, this was a valuable attempt, but we know now that mitochondrial genomes can be useful in some contexts, but they are not suitable for the reconstruction of very old splitting events. The next, please. So I should come back briefly to the pan crustacea hypothesis. This shows, I've mentioned this already, that hexapods invaded the terrestrial environment independently. And this means that characters formally interpreted as apomorphies of the tracheata are now additional apomorphies of hexapoda. The next, please. This includes, for instance, the tracheal system, probably the Malpighian tubules, a true labium, the loss of the midgut glands, uh, fertilization with a spermatophore and other features. So with this, the monophyly of hexapoda is definitely a fact very strongly confirmed by very different sources of evidence. Thank you. The next. A seemingly intractable, very difficult problem is the basal branching pattern in hexapoda. The relationships between three of the apterigote orders, the relatively large orders of uh, Columbula, the springtails, and the small orders Propuva on the upper left and the Dipluva upper right. Hennig postulated uh, a monophyletic origin of these three orders, the clade and Tognatha, mainly based on uh, internalized mouth parts. The next, please. Alternatively, Yarmila Kukalova Pek, 1991, uh, proposed a group she called Zelkovera, a sister group between the Diplura and the Insecta in the narrow sense, the Ectognatha, the Sargentoma, the Archaeognatha and the pterygoid insects. Zalkophora, this name goes back to the presence of cerci, terminal appendages of the abdomen. Another potential apomorphy would be paired claws. And a quite convincing feature is the sperm axoneme with a pattern 9 plus 9 plus 2. This means an additional circle of nine microtubules in the sperm axonine. Next, please. So this was re-evaluated very thoroughly by Karen Moisemann in the framework of the One Kai project, of course, Karen and other co-workers. And the results are still ambiguous. There is phylogenetic signal for endognatha there is an about equally strong signal for the cell cover of Kukalova Peck. What can be ruled out now is a presumptive 
played non populata with the protuberance in the diplurance, both eyeless. Uh, this was postulated based on single genes, but this is now obsolete. In the transcriptome, there is almost absolutely no support for this hypothesis. The next, please. So what is rock solid with morphology and also with transcriptomes is the monophyly of Ectognatha, Archaeognatha, silverfish and the pterygoid insects. Also a sister group relationship, Zygentoma, pterygoid insects as already suggested by Donner. And then of course, the next please, the monophyly of the pterygoid insects, emergence of this group, the acquisition of light organs of wings was definitely the most important single step in insect evolution. Again, like what I might call the endognatha problem, we have Still great difficulties in reconstructing the relationships of the three major lineages. In other words, the basal splitting events, the relationships between the mayflies, Ephemeroptera on the left side, the dragonflies and damselflies on the right side, and then the mega diverse Neoptera, which comprise all other pterygoid lineages, characterized by the abilities to fold back the wing over the abdomen. Therefore, they are called Neoptera. <coughs> Hennig suggested a uh, monophylum Peleoptera comprising the automator and the mayflies. Bristle-like, very short antennae would be a possible synapomorphy, aquatic larvae, also specific features of the mouth parts. The next, please. An alternative was suggested by Boutreau, 1979, in his very often cited but rather superficial book. Chiastomiaria, a sister group relationship between the mayflies and the Neopteran orders. He suggested indirect flight musculature as a potential synapomorphy and also direct fertilization with the post abdominal ideagus. The next, please. Then a third alternative, Metapterygota. In this case, the Odonator as the sister group of the Neopterans, postulated mainly by Arnold Stanitzek in 2000, mainly based on characters of the mandibular articulations and related muscular features. Another Interesting feature, potential apomorphy would be the loss of the subimago. The subimago is a winged immature stage which only occurs in the mayflies, but not in the odonata and the neopterine insects. So the paleoptera problem, as it is called, is apparently extremely difficult. Uh, the next, please. This was also carefully reanalyzed with very large transcriptomic data with a very good taxon sampling. Also, Karen Moiseman was involved. Sabrina Simon was the first author of this study, published in 2018. Finally, what they found out was again ambivalent. There is signal for Paleoptera, there is an about equally strong signal for Chiastomiaria in the data, but almost no signal for Metapterygota suggested by Stanitzek. So again, this remains an open problem. 
apparently the motto of the US Army Corps of Engineers does not work, get a bigger machine, despite of tremendous effort and molecular data. This is still an open question. The next, please. A difficult group already recognized by Hennig and other workers, for instance, Nils Christensen, is Polyneoptera. The next, please. These are hemimetabolous insects, mostly characterized by glaciomorphic features. Well known group like stoneflies, earwigs, grasshoppers in the widest sense, the phasmatodia. Roaches, brain mantises, web spinners, less known small groups like the recently described Mantrophasmatodia and the ice crawlers, and very obscure the Zoraptra, the ground lice. Next, please. The monophyletic origin was very seriously questioned. Nils Christensen did not use polyneoptera, but only the neutral term lower neopterans, especially the stoneflies, the plecopterans, were considered as problematic. And a whole bunch of competing hypotheses were presented based on different data sets. And the next, please. Nils Christensen, who was always very cautious and conservative, presented this almost completely unresolved diagram, which became known as Christensen's comb among systematic entomologists. The next, please. A very important step uh, was made in Machida's lab, uh, University of Tsukuba. He's a very close friend of mine and an insect developmental biologist in the first place. Uh, Yuta Mashimo, a PhD student, he did a tremendous job and he found the first convincing evidence for the monophyly of Polyneoptera, including these obscure Zoraptera, the ground lice. The ground lice were much disputed, uh, and Willy Hennig, for instance, placed them as sister group of Perineoptera. These developmental features now strongly suggested that they belong to monophyletic Polyneoptera. The next, please. So, and this was confirmed by the One Kite project as suggested by Yuta Mashimo and Ryu Machida, polyneoptera are monophyletic, including the disputed stoneflies and also including the very obscure small group of the Zoraptera. And this is the phylogenetic pattern. I will treat this only very briefly. Uh, the basal branch is Irvix plus Zoraptera, the second branch, the stoneflies, the third branch, the orthoptera, grasshoppers, the group with the highest diversity among the polyneopteran orders, and then a large clade containing as sister taxa, the wingless Chryloplatodia and Mantrophasmatodia, two very small groups, then the Phasmatodia, not as close as relatives of the orthoptera, but of the web spinners, the embioptera, and then uh, a well-founded clade. This was long for a, known for a long time. The dictyoptera comprising the praying mantises, mantodia, assist the group of the platodia, platodia, including the termites, the Isoptera, which are not really a separate order anymore in classifications. So uh, when this, uh, no, please go back. When Misov et al. 2014 was started, we thought this is still quite shaky and the backbone of this branch 
rather weak, but this was also very carefully re-examined, re-analyzed by Wipfler et al. 2018. Benny Wipfler was a PhD student of mine, and this data set with a strongly extended taxon sampling for the polyneoptron groups confirmed exactly the same result, the same pattern as you can see here, and therefore this is at least a solid hypothesis. Please, the next one. And this is the second large subgroup of the neopteran insects, the Paraneoptera called Azalcaria by Hennig, very successful, about 110,000 described species comprising the non monophyletic bark lice, Socoptera, the true lice, Thysinoptera or thrips. Then the Ochenorynchia, the cicada in the widest sense, a very successful group with about 45,000 species. The plant lice, Sternorynchia, a medium sized group, a very small group, the Gondwanan mossbugs, Goleorynchia, and then again very successful the true bugs, the Heteroptera with about 40,000 species. So one of the big surprises of one kite was that this lineage did not turn out as monophyletic. Uh, nobody really uh, believed this. Uh, and this was, of course, in clear contrast to Hennig, Christensen, and others. Even though most features of Paraneoptera are reductions, like the reduction of number of Malpighian tubules, or tarsomeres, or the loss of the cerci, but still uh, there is a number of apomorphies uh, at least tentatively supporting this group, and this was not confirmed in one kite. Next, please. The psocotia, the bark lice, and the true lice, together they form a clade were not placed as sister of the remaining Perineoptera, but as sister to the Holometopolis insects. And this was also reanalyzed with an extended taxon sampling. Gavin Johnson was the first author of this study, 2018. And again, there was an ambivalent signal in the data set, signal for monophyletic perineoptera, but also an equally strong signal for Socodia plus Holometabula. So I also tried very hard to evaluate this from the morphological perspective, but I could not find a single potential synapomorphy of Socodia plus Holometabula. So I tend to think that still perineoptera are monophyletic, but again, this is an open question. So the next, please. The last and by far the largest subgroup of neoprene insects is the Holometabula, also called Endopterygota. We carried out a uh, two projects on this group, both funded by the German Science Foundation. The first based on a very large morphological data set. The second on transcriptomes, of course, linked with one kite. You certainly know these groups, some mega diverse group, the beetles, the coleoptera are by far the largest, about 380,000 described species. Then the other so-called big four, Lepidopterans, the Hymenoptera and the true flies, the Diptera, each with about 150,000 described species. Other groups, well known ectoparasitic fleas, the neuropteric orders, net winged insects in the widest sense, the caddis flies, and then maybe less well known, the small order of the Mycopterans on the lower left and on the upper right, the parasitic strepsipterans. 
in any case, uh, I'm happy to say that the phylogeny of Holometabola is almost completely solved now. The next, please. An important point is that Hymenoptera are not placed as sister to Mecopterida, as it was suggested by Hennig and Christensen, but as the sister to all remaining Holometabolous orders. And this unit is now called Aparaglosata. And this is also well supported by morphological apomorphies. The loss of the paraglose, this is why they are called aparaglosata, a simplified labium. The simplification or even reduction of the orthoptery ovipositor, which is well developed in the ground plan of the hymenoptera, and the reduction of the number of malpigian tubules, maximum eight, usually six or four, in contrast to up to 40 in the hymenopterans. Then there is a well-supported clade combining the three already mentioned neuropterid orders, Neuroptera, the Megaloptera, and the Raphidioptera on one hand, and the megadiverse Coleoptera and the specialized small order Screpsiptera on the other. And the latter clade is called Coleopterida, and this is very strongly supported. So the Hyteria hypothesis is definitely completely obsolete. And I'm happy to say that recent morphological anal analysis also strongly and unambiguously supported the Coleopterida. And then, very briefly, Mecopterida, as suggested by Hennig and also Christensen, were strongly supported, divided into plates on the one side, the caddisflies, Precoptera, as very strongly supported sister taxon of the megadiverse Lepidoptera, Amphius Menoptera, and then as sister the Antliophora, the pump bearers, as Willy Henny called them, in all three groups, uh, sperm pumps occur, but apparently they have evolved independently at least two times. These are the fleas, the true flies, and the small order of the Mecoptera. Please, the next. And the last problem in Tonometabula, the last. Uh, Serious problem is the monophyly of this small order comprising about 600 species. The results were ambivalent for a long time. This was also carefully reanalyzed. The study is presently still under review. And it turned out the strongest signal indicates that the unusual Gondwanan small family Nanoporistidae may be the sister taxon of the ectoparasitic fleas. So this what would imply that mecopterans in the traditional sense uh, would be paraphyletic, but uh, to turn it in a different way, apparently the relatively species-rich ectoparasitic fleas are a subordinate branch of the mecopterans now in a wider sense. So, please the next. Summarizing this, we can say that with a theoretically sound concept of phylogenetic reconstruction and morphology, Willy Hennig could solve already many problems in insect systematics. This is quite remarkable, and uh, you could say that the one chi tree looks very similar. And in the meantime, aside from some deviations caused by unsuitable markers and unsuitable analytical methods like POI, the molecular results converged 
towards Enix, so to speak. So you could argue uh, you invested a lot of time and money and effort, and this looks almost the same. So was this not a great way, waste of energy and resources? I would not agree at all with this. First of all, the progress in terms of methods was tremendous. The possibility to allow, to analyze together such large molecular data sets was an enormous achievement. The refinement of the analytical methods to provide such an enormous genetic data sets, also the functional role of genes already play an important role, and this will be a very important field of investigation uh, for the future. Then some really solid phylogenetic results, especially in polyneoptera, but also, for instance, the placement of hymenopterans. Some results are really new and innovative. And then uh, last but not least, for the first time, uh, we obtained a robust time frame for the evolution of the entire hexapoda with estimations of the time of origin for all major lineages. And again, I want to use this opportunity to emphasize that a solid, uh, well-founded placement of fossils, of course, in this, day, in, in this case, always based on morphology and thorough evaluation is very important. Wrong placements of fossils can lead to very misleading interpretations. Next, please. Next. Yeah, I already uh, mentioned this point. Maybe we continue with the next slide. So there is no single or simple answer what can be done to solve the remaining apparently uh, very difficult problems like the endognatha or paleoptera problem. Then the taxon sampling may help in some cases closing gaps. So especially long branches can cause problems. Further refinement of analytical procedures is always an option. And then what is most important in my view is a close and efficient cooperation between molecular systematists, bioinformaticians, paleontologists, developmental biologists, and last but not least, but not least morphologists and anatomists. Of course, please next. This includes Hennig's principle of wechselseitige Erhellung, reciprocal enlightenment in English. So I'm sure with such a complex approach, we will be able to uh, develop a very complex picture of insect evolution in the future. So what are my plans for the next years? As some of you know, I'm in retirement since about one year. What I want to intensify is my studies of insect evolution in the dimension of time. I became very greatly interested in studying impression fossils, but also amber inclusions. This is really fascinating. But I also want to dedicate my efforts to uh, really depressing problems, a scenario taking place presently, the rapidly declining diversity and also biomass of insects. So we cannot do much probably as individual researchers, but instead of uh, working in our confined individual or collective ivory towers, we must confront ourselves with the challenges of the future of this planet, also as systematic entomologists. 
thank you very much. Maybe the next, of course, I should thank all my co-workers. This is only a small uh, selection from different countries and continents. Without them, this would not have been possible, of course. And the next, please. I also want the German Science Foundation. They funded about 10 or more than 10 of my projects. The DRD was very helpful in some cases, supporting PhD students. And the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation is really a very positive institution, supported several of my postdoctoral researchers. And now I'm sorry again for the delay. I'm at the end of my presentation. I will be happy to answer questions. And thank you very much for your patience and your attention. Muchas gracias a todos. Rolf, thank you very much for your very enlightening and very interesting presentation, which is a great synthesis, a great summary of what has happened in, in several decades of intensive work in this field. Um, I don't see many questions from the audience. However, I would like to ask you a, a question myself. Um, from, from the origin of insects as a sister to a crustacean group, would you say the ancestral insect or the origin of insects was in the aquatic environment? So somehow all insects are derived from an aquatic ancestor. It, and I ask this because of the terrestrial colambulans, terrestrial uh, diplurans, terrestrial apterigotes. Is this a conflict with this view of an aquatic origin? I would not say so. I would say that the common ancestor of the entire hexapoda was already living in moist environments, moist but already terrestrial. So this shift took place uh, according to our calculations or estimations already in the Ordovician. So the ancestor already switched to terrestrial environments. But if we go back, there must have been intermediate forms living in semi-aquatic and aquatic environments. But we don't know any such fossils. Haas and co-workers thought Devonohexapotus is such a stem group hexapod, but it did, didn't turn out that way. But they come from the water, definitely. Thanks, Rolf. It seems my microphone makes interference. So I'll try to be brief. Uh, there are some comments here. Um, someone asking a student some advice about if they want to start applied studies on insect morphology. Some advice for students on insect morphology. Uh, you should make yourself familiar with the techniques. Learning techniques is always very useful. So you can start with the lupa and doing a lot of drawings is very helpful. So observing precisely and first of all, working with the light microscope and making drawings is very important. And this can be done at every institution. This is crucial. But then if you have access to other techniques, this is also very good in the second step using SEM is totally super for surface structures. And then if you have the opportunity, micro CT is a fantastic technique for studying the interior of the body, including soft parts. So I would suggest a stepwise procedure, starting with a light microscope and doing lots of drawings, SEM, and then you can do something micro CT. And if you want advice, you can write me at any time and I would be very happy to help you. Thank you. Um, a colleague from the Institute, Dr. Maria El Carmen Gonzalez asked, if you could make a comment about the association between insects and fungi. 
I think this played a very important uh, role in insect evolution. So especially the endognathous groups uh, with their mouth parts, they cannot cope with hard substrate. So the mandibles of the basal hexapods, they have still high movability at the base. And these groups like Corempola, Diplorans, also Archeognatha, they rely on soft substrates. This can build the fungal hyphae, fungal spores, but also algae and similar things, but they cannot cope with really hard materials. But then uh, relationships with fungi played uh, an important role in insect evolution over and over again. Uh, I'm primarily a coleopterist and in large groups of coleoptera and difficult different groups of coleoptera, again, specializations on fungal hyphae or fungal spores have played a very important role. Also, I have mentioned the psocoptera, the bark lice, also for them it's important. So the relationship, the importance of this relationship between these two very different groups of organisms cannot be overestimated. It's very, very important. So fungi played an enormous role in insect evolution. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yvonne Garzon, also from the Institute, asked if um, this agreement between the groups predicted by Hennig and what was found later with technology and other methods could be also due to the application of Hennig's auxiliary principle. And if you could elaborate something about, about this development. So Hennig suggested different methods of phylogenetic reconstruction. First of all, the evaluation of morphological characters and this combined with the principle of synapomorphy. This was the main basis of Hennig's work. But then he said, there are also different criteria, so the ontogenetic criterion can play, play a role for uh, assessing the character state polarity. And also uh, the paleontological criterion, but he took this very cautiously. He said when we find an older fossil and this character state, this does not necessarily mean that this is the plesiomorphy and the alternative is the apomorphy. This can be by accident that you find one fossil in the deeper layer and the other in a higher level. So uh, what is maybe uh, important, what is done in cladistic investigations, including parsimony analysis uh, of molecular data is basically the same what Hennig did, identifying uh, synapomorphies. What is done in this transcriptomic analysis is something different. These are likelihood methods. This is not the same thing what Hennig did. So I'm sorry, I cannot really explain you the algorithms, but this works in a different way. Also, Bayesian inference is something difficult, uh, different. So the methods are advancing, but but I think what Hennig did, that was one really essential step towards what we are making now in terms of progress. Thanks. Thanks, Rolf, very much. And maybe a couple of questions more before concluding. Um, Javier Victor asks if besides Socodia, are there other conspicuous points of conflict between the phylogenetic signal of current, current morphological and genomic databases? Uh, I don't really think so. There is not a major point of conflict. So, so what made us also quite confident, uh, and this is not really self-understood, is that all previously recognized orders and also major subordinate groups were confirmed by one kind. So the conflict is really minimal. None of the orders was retrieved as paraphyletic. Only the case uh, of the Psocodia is kind of disturbing. <laughs> 
But another interesting result that transcriptomes also showed that the psocoptera are not monophylated. In this case, this order was not confirmed as a clade. But this was already previously suggested by Yoshizawa based on morphology. So the congruence between transcriptomes and morphology is generally very good. Great. Uh, one more question. Oliver Betts asks if, according to one kite, mandibulata didn't come up as monophyletic. Is this a reliable result? Uh, I would say mandibulata are monophyletic. There are alternative hypotheses. In this case, I know there is also conflicting evidence. But if you ask me, <laughs> maybe I'm too old school, but for me, the alternative, it was postulated that uh, the chelicerates and myriapods may be sister taxa, I think paradoxopoda or something. I don't believe this is really uh, would be the true placement of myriapods. In my opinion, myriapods are the first branch in, mandibula in monophyletic mandibulata, as is the group of the pancrustacea. So I, I can say in terms of morphology, mandibulata is really solid and there is also molecular support for this. So this may be ambiguous to a certain degree, but I would strongly tend to the hypothesis of a clade mandibulata. Thank you. Okay, I think we can close with this one. Um, and the question is by Edmundo Gonzalez. Are you including also ecological, ecological or any other data besides morphology and molecules? Uh, not really in the analysis. So ecological data we don't use for the phylogenetic reconstruction. But of course, based on the phylogeny we obtain, we can address different ecological questions. This is obvious. So ecology, of course, is one extremely important field. And uh, I think if we understand insect evolution better or we want to get a clearer picture, we have, of course, it's necessary to take ecology in consideration very strongly. Wonderful. Well, I guess we could close here. Lazaro, thank you very much, Rolf, for your very interesting enlightening presentation we would like to know more learn more from you in the future and about your findings we'll be paying attention to your publications and of course it will be great to have you in mexico sometime as uh, time permits in the uh, near future thank you very much very much Lazaro, Ilano, Many people send greetings and congratulations yes. messages in the chat. Thank you very much, Professor Boitel, for this fantastic, fantastic journey through the systematic um, insects uh, and coyotes sometimes, but we know that this is, this is part of the job. So I'm just putting some uh, comments from the audience. And uh, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atilano, also for being here with us. And a la gente que nos ve, les recuerdo que este fue el quinto seminario de Fronteras. Es el penúltimo. El último va a ser el 11 de mayo con el Dr. Enrico Cohen. Entonces, los esperamos eh, para entonces. Ya saben, la, eh, la liga para las, eh, toda la información referente a los seminarios de Fronteras, que se las enviamos... Eh, constantemente a través de los correos. Sin más, otra vez, gracias a todos por estar aquí y por estar presentes todavía eh, hasta este momento. Gracias y hasta pronto. Gracias.